you go ahead and open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, um, do justice, love mercy. Um, we're going to have a, uh, we're starting a new series in two weeks. Just wanted to kind of throw that up there. I thought it was going to be a little video promo, but we're going to have a, um, uh, just a couple of weeks where we look at what doing justice and loving mercy looks like in the Roanoke Valley. Again, that'll start in two weeks. We'll play trailer again next week just to kind of remind you of that. But man, if you're visiting with us, I want to welcome you to New Century Church. Uh, my name's Chase. I'm one of the pastors here. Grateful you're here. And when you came in, you got a little worship guide. And in that worship guide, there's a little tear-out card. Especially if you're new with us, would you mind filling out whatever you're comfortable with on that? You can give it back to us later. Uh, we're not going to spam you. We're not going to knock on your door. Uh, but we will donate $10 to the Blue Ridge Women's Center for everyone we get. And this just gives us a way to care for you in a way that's not intrusive and comfortable uh, kind of for you. Um, you know, every now and then, there is something that happens in real life. Um, when I say real life, I mean our lives, that almost exactly mirrors something that happens in the Bible. And uh, I'll never forget um, just when this hit me. Earlier this year, this is a golf example. I try to keep those to a minimum. I know both of you would like if I use those every week, but I tried to uh, keep those to a minimum. But this was so perfect. Uh, there was a golfer named Matt Kuchar, went down to Mexico, and he, needed to, he didn't have his caddy with him. His caddy couldn't help him that week. And so he rented a caddy from the, uh, from the country club, all right? And this caddy normally makes about $200 a day, all right? And he told this caddy, doesn't really know the guy, they never worked together, but he needed a caddy for the week. He said, I'll pay you $5,000 even if I don't win anything. I mean, win or lose, I get zero, you get 5000 If I win, you get 5000 you know. This is more than this guy's probably ever made in one week in his entire life. And so he's like, absolutely, I'll do it. Well, Matt Kuchar won the tournament, okay? Like $1.296 million. And he gave the guy his $5,000. And would you know that he was really upset? This guy was like, I deserve more. He wanted $50,000, right? So he was happy with what he was going to get until he saw what Matt Kuchar got. And then he's like, let's do a 10x multiple um, on that. Let's up it to 50 grand. And initially, Matt Kuchar defended his decision, as I think he was within his right to do, and then he, he gave him his you know, 45 grand extra. Um, but when I, when I saw that, I was like, man, that really is very, very similar to a text in the Bible. And it's the text we're going to study today. And... Um, Man, this just reveals so much about our heart, okay? Uh, j just to, Melissa just read it, but I just want to give you the lay of the land, and then we'll dive into kind of the significance and the meaning of it. There's this master um, who has a vineyard, and he needs it to be harvested, all right? Like today, he hires a lot of workers, okay? Now, the Jewish work day was from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was 12 hours. And so this guy goes out early in the morning at 6 a.m., and he finds some guys in the marketplace. The marketplace is where people would gather to hire themselves out for the day, okay? Um, and so this guy goes to the marketplace, he finds some workers, and he says, I'll give you a day's wage as a denarius. A denarius was a standard wage for one day's work of labor for the common laborer or a foot soldier. And I say, that's good with me, and he sends him into the vineyard. And then the master comes back at 9 a.m., and he says that he'll give you, I'll say, I'll give you what's fair to these other workers. And the workers, okay, okay, that's fine. And then they go into the vineyard. The master comes back at 12, and then at 3, and then at 5. And he gets more workers, and he sends them all into the vineyard. So this is really all just a setup, though, for what's about to happen. This is where it really gets good, okay? Verse 8, um, the whole point of the parable really comes into focus. The owner, the master of the vineyard, says, all right, tells his manager, circle everyone up and pay them. Circle everyone up and pay them. And the workers that got hired at 5 o'clock, who only worked one hour, they go first. And they go to the front of the line, and they get a denarius for one hour's worth of work. Now, if you'll remember, that's what the 12-hour workers agreed to work for. The one-hour workers get a day's worth of wages for one hour's worth of work. And so when uh, the 12-hour workers see the one-hour workers get a denarius, their eyes get huge. They're like, oh, man, 
he's probably going to give us 12 times what he gave them. And when it's their turn to get to the front of the line, they get a denarius. And they're not happy. And they say, well, hold on. You, you gave them a denarius. He's like, yes, I did. But, but didn't I give you what we agreed on? Well, I mean, yeah, I guess. I mean, he says in verse 13, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last, last worker as I give to you. Now, if we're being honest, isn't there something about that that just kind of bothers us? It just feels like it's not quite fair. Like, we get, we get the logic, okay? Yes, this is technically what they agreed on. But these guys only work one hour, and they got, like, the same as the people who worked. Ah, just, there's something. We, we get the logic. We understand what Jesus is saying here, the, or the Master is saying, but it just doesn't sit well with us. Something about it rubs us the wrong way. Now, let me offer you just a Bible reading tip. This is really valuable. If you get to the place when you're studying the Bible and Jesus says something that produces some sort of negative emotion in you, Jesus is always right. And your negative emotion about what he said is always wrong. And it's a very valuable teaching moment. These moments are God's grace to you. Don't waste them. When you're reading the scripture and Jesus says or does something that, oh, it just doesn't sit well with you, learn. This is a valuable teaching moment because he's right, you're wrong, there's no one around to see, you're just reading the Bible and learn and grow. Okay? This, and so we're, that's what we're going to do this morning. That's what we're going to do. And as we do, we're going to learn more about the glory of God, we're going to learn about ourselves and how that knowledge propels us to more faithful living for Christ. So I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to definitely pray for myself. I need all the help I can get up here. And, uh, and then we'll start. Will you pray with me? Father, we wouldn't be so foolish as to think that we could come to you in our own name. And we rejoice this morning that we don't have to, that we can come to you in the name of another. We come to you in Jesus' name. On the basis of his work. On the basis of a life that he lived on our behalf. Life we should have lived, but didn't. Death we should have died, but didn't. God, we stand... Um, absolutely at your mercy through the grace of Jesus. And we're so grateful for that. We're so grateful that you don't love us based on how good we are and how well we perform. And God, I pray uh, that as we turn to this text, you would help us see the beauty of the gospel. You would help us see sin in our own hearts. You would help us respond with repentance and faith. You would help us be encouraged with the incredible master of the vineyard who has called us to himself and given us reward, eternal reward. So God, I pray that you would give everyone within earshot of my voice, an ear to hear, eyes to see, soft hearts to receive your truth. God, help me as I communicate this. I'm not capable of changing anyone's heart. As much as I'd like to, Father, only the Spirit can do that. So would you guard my lips? And if I say something that's helpful, God, would you cause it to bear fruit in the hearts of those who hear? But God, in the event that I were to say something that's not faithful, would it quickly fall away? All for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Okay. So I want to give us, based on this text, three exhortations. Three exhortations that I think represent what God has for us today in Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16 in the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, okay? So, here we go. You ready to dive in? Number one, God is always just and gives us far better than we deserve. Our God is always just, always just, and gives us far better than we deserve. Notice, when they grumble, the first thing the master does in verse 13 is say, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? And their unspoken answer is, well, yes, but I saw what you gave the other person. It's not fair. Like, you've done everything, you've given me everything you said you'd give me, but I deserve more. It's not enough. Like, you've kept your promises to me. Yes, but it's not enough. I deserve more.
Now, I think one of the reasons that this story is off-putting to us is because there's a part of us that identifies with the complaint of these workers. Is there? There is a part of us that identifies with their complaint. I mean, think about it. When you read this story, do you tend to see yourself as the people getting far more than they deserve, who leave with way more than they earned or could ever ask for? Or do you tend to see yourself as the people who kind of got the short straw? The people in the parable who got the short straw and everyone else around them just did a little bit better. Who do we, who do we tend to see ourselves as in a parable like this? I'll never forget uh, when Josh moved here. He's out right now preparing for our small group leader training after the service. But when Josh moved here, um, they moved all his stuff into a storage unit for a while, and I was there for that. Um, but on the day that they moved all his stuff uh, from the storage unit uh, to the house, uh, it was a Saturday, and I spent most of my Saturday mornings working on my sermon content, and I wasn't able to uh, make most of it. But I did show up. I showed up um, like after every, all the work had been done pretty much. I literally carried like one box in the house. Greg had been there like all day. He'd like painted the house. Okay, he'd done everything. And me and Greg, I carried one box in. We break for lunch and we both ate the same pizza. It was great. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I, mean, I came in at the last hour, bro, and I ate the same meat pizza. And I think like, oh man, that's great. That's such a good deal for me, right? But when I look at a parable like this, I, I don't take the same approach. I don't see myself as the one who gets far more than they deserve, who shows up at the 11th hour and gets the blessing. Like, we're tempted to take a different attitude to this story, aren't we? Like, if we're being honest, I've, I've never met a single person who reads this story and rejoices in God's grace in the life of the 11th hour workers. I am so happy for them. No one reads this story and says, I am so happy that they got so much money for so little work. Oh, I'm so encouraged by the master's generosity to the one-hour workers. No, no, no. We see ourselves as the 12-hour workers. And when we look at them, honestly, we, we, may, we might even feel sorry for them. We're like, oh, man, that's a tough rub. <sighs> Maybe that even feels like your life. I feel like that 12-hour worker, everyone just getting more than me, getting ahead of me, not working as hard as me. I think one of the main reasons is that we have a distorted view of what we deserve. You and I have a distorted view of what we deserve. We live in a culture of entitlement that tells us that everyone is fundamentally good and everyone deserves everything they want. Everyone deserves everything they want. We deserve money. We deserve health. We deserve homes and cars. We deserve uh, wonderful uh, romantic relationships. And if you don't have these things, then you haven't been given your due. You're owed those things. And the only problem with that is that it's not true. Like, it's not true. And until you really understand this, God's grace will never be amazing to you. And you'll always just feel like you have less than you deserve. Man, I deserve more. You'll always feel entitled. Listen, the, the reason grace is so amazing is because you and I, when we read the Bible, we find out that we deserve something very different. <laughs> you and I don't deserve it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be grace. The Bible tells us that we actually deserve something very different from what our culture tells us. Ephesians 2 says that you and I are objects of wrath. Romans 3 says there is none, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. Their throats are an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Like, they have no fear of God before their eyes. Like, th we deserve wrath. We need to be so clear this morning, at the very beginning here, that if God were to look at us in our sin and pass us over 
and choose to condemn us for our sin, he would be completely just in doing so. God does not, does not owe anyone a shot at redemption. God does not owe anyone forgiveness. And we tend to think that, you know, I, I deserve Jesus dying on the cross for me so I can have a second chance. I deserve a second chance. I mean, I deserve a shot at redemption and forgiveness. That's not true. We don't deserve that. And if you think of the cross like that, and you think of God's grace like that, then you'll completely distort the beauty of it. It's grace because you don't deserve it. Which means this. The good news of the gospel, this is why I'm so passionate about the gospel, this is why it's so good, listen to me, is that the good news of the gospel is not that everyone gets what they deserve. That's not the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that by God's grace, you don't have to get what you deserve. You don't have to get what you deserve. Because someone else got what you deserve. In your place. Like someone else got what you deserve, man. And every moment of life that's lived united to Christ and experiencing relationship with Him is far more than we deserve, even if we don't have some of the things that we wish we would have. Far more than we deserve. I can't tell you how much I love being the pastor of this church. I don't deserve that. I don't deserve to have a wonderful spouse. I don't deserve to have enough money to have a home and a car. I don't deserve to be healthy. I don't deserve any of that. I, I, I can't tell you how happy I am that Rebecca and I have a little child growing in her tummy. But listen to me. Listen. If the Lord in His infinite wisdom and love decides to take that child home, He has done me no wrong. Job says it best. The Lord gives... And the Lord takes away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Far be it from us that we would ever say, the Lord gives, and He better not take away, because I earned it. God, give us hearts of gratitude for the immeasurable riches You've given us in Christ Jesus. God is always just, and He gives us far more than we deserve. Number two. Number two this morning. God's grace is a gift, not a payment. God's grace is a gift, not a payment. Now, this guy makes five total trips to the marketplace, all right? Now, this story is not about, like, systems management because, I mean, you need to, like, you should have hired more workers at the beginning of the day. That's not the point of this parable, okay? Better hiring practices. He makes five trips to the market, and on the very last trip at the 11th hour, his five, five o'clock trip, he has an interaction with the workers that is very crucial for understanding of this parable. Let's read it real quick. Verse 6 says this, And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? You've been here, sitting here for eleven hours. And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. And he said to them, You go into the vineyard too. Um, I don't know if you ever got picked last for kickball, but this is probably what it feels like you did. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you got picked last for kickball or like basketball. Or like, this is probably what they felt like. These guys have been in the marketplace all day, and they're like, "Will you hire me? Will you hire me? No. Will you hire me? No." And they've been there for eleven hours, and no one wants them. No one wants them. Now, I don't know if it's because they didn't look marketable. I didn't know if it, maybe they looked uh, strange. They smell bad. I mean, I don't. I don't know what it is, but for whatever reason, no one wanted. No one looked at these people and said, oh man, they'd make a valuable contribution to my project. I'm going to hire them. They were just left in the marketplace. They were the least desirable. And the point, the point here is that the master hires the least desirable people, the people that the world doesn't see as valuable, the people the world doesn't want at a time that no one would ever want them. No one hires people at 5 o'clock for a day that ends at 6 Not only does he bring these least desirable people into his vineyard, they receive the same reward as everyone else does. The least desirable people who work the least amount of time, who are the least deserving, get the same reward. Now, there's two ways to think about a reward. This is really important for us this morning. Two ways to think about a reward. You can think of a reward as either a gift 
or a payment? A gift or a payment? And the way you understand the reward in this parable has everything to do with how you interpret it, how you understand it. What's a payment? A payment is something that you give someone for the work or services they've rendered. It is a compensation for their effort and service and work. A gift is different. A gift is something that's given to you apart from your works and perhaps even despite some of your works. And the question before us then is, the reward in this parable, which one is it? Is it like a payment or is it like a gift? And what's interesting is that we are initially um, led to believe that this reward is like a payment, right? He goes out, hey, I'll give you a day's wage for a day's labor. And what we're led to believe initially is that the compensation is proportional with the effort. You get a day's wage for a day's work. This is payment. But the narrative takes a twist at the end, when the foreman calls the people in to pay them. And rather than giving the one-hour workers one-twelfth of what he gives the twelve-hour workers, the master gives everyone the same. Same amount. Now, if you were watching this, here's what you'd think. You may put your hand on your chin and you go, huh, I don't really see the connection between what he's giving them and how hard they tried, and how long they worked. I, I don't, it doesn't seem like what he's rewarding them with really has anything to do with how much they did. Because they're all getting the same. They work different amounts of time. And it's here that we realize that this reward isn't a compensation for services rendered. It's a gift of grace that is totally unconnected with how hard or how long they worked. Remember, the gift here is eternal life. The reward here in the parable is eternal life. And listen, I don't know if you're just checking out Christianity today. Okay, maybe this is like your first time in church in your whole life. Really grateful you're here. There is this idea. I just want to clear this up. Like, There's an idea in the culture and even in some of our churches that Christianity is believing in God and working hard to be a good person. And then salvation is kind of God's uh, reward or payment for your efforts of service to Him. So, so you try really hard to like live for Him, and then He pays you because you worked really hard. He pays you with salvation as a reward for all your trying. And this parable explodes that lie. The whole point of the master paying the same amount to, to different hours worked is to show that God's gift of eternal life doesn't depend on how long or how hard you've worked. Because no amount of effort could ever earn this reward. It's not a payment for how much you've done. It's a gift despite everything you've done. It's a gift despite everything you've done. And because it's completely unearned, there's no limit to the scope of this grace. God saves strong people who, get picked, who have marketable skills who get picked first for kickball, and he saves weak people who don't seem to have a lot of skills, aren't valuable in the world's eyes, and get picked last for kickball. I mean, he saves John the Baptist, listen, before he takes his first breath, and he saves the thief on the cross right before he takes his last. Jesus saves people who are being bad by running from God, and he saves people who are trying to work to God by being good. Both are equally in need of the gospel, and salvation is offered to both of them. Jesus doesn't save people who earn it. He saves people who are brutally honest about the fact that they never could. They never could. And they entrust themselves to the only one who can reconcile them to God, and that's Jesus who's lived the life they were supposed to live. Died the death they were supposed to die. And when we repent and believe, we get credit for that. It's the hope of the gospel. It's the hope of the gospel. God's grace to us is a gift, not a payment. Number three. Number three. 
God's extravagant generosity should lead us to rejoicing, not resentment. God's extravagant generosity should lead us to rejoicing, not resentment. So crucial to this parable is is this element where the 12-hour workers get to see what the one-hour workers get paid. If all of this would have happened in the back room, in some kind of private room, everyone would have left happy. Right? Everyone would have left happy. The the twelve hour workers would have been happy with the denarius they agreed to work for. They only become dissatisfied. Listen, they only become dissatisfied with what the master is giving them when they look around and see what he's given everyone else. They're they're happy with their denarius until they see what the master has given other people, and suddenly they're not happy anymore. Comparison robs them of their joy and keeps them from rejoicing in the Master's grace, be it to other people or even to them. Comparison robs them of their joy and keeps them from celebrating the Master's grace in other people's lives and even in their own life. C.S. Lewis is so helpful here. Maybe one of the best C.S. Lewis quotes ever. Read it with me on the screen. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better-looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good-looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud. The pleasure of being above the rest. Well, that's exactly what's at the center of these workers' complaints and discontentment. In fact, they're so honest to admit it. In verse 12, they tell us while they're upset, it's not that the master hasn't kept his end of the deal. They tell us, these these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us. That's what you've done. You made them equal to us. They're not mad about the master's fairness to them. They're mad about his generosity to someone else. They are not mad about the master's fairness to them. They're mad about his generosity to someone else. That's crazy, but it's close to home, isn't it? Master responds brilliantly, just calls him right out, says, I am, am I not allowed? to do what I choose with what belongs to me, or do you begrudge my generosity? Literally, in the Greek, that's an idiom there. It says, is your eye evil because of my generosity? In other words, are you simply mad because I showed grace to someone else who didn't deserve it? Are you mad that I blessed someone else who didn't deserve it either? And their answer is, yeah, yeah. This is us. Like We're fine celebrating God's grace in other people's lives as long as it's not something we really want. You know, I mean, when I I remember like in Christmas morning when I was growing up as a kid, how many presents do I have in my stack? He has a couple more, right? And so like I could celebrate when my brother Tyler opened like some socks. I'll be like, oh, that's really good. I'm so glad that Grandma gave you some socks, Tyler. Like I can celebrate that. No, I don't care about that. But listen, if he got like a video game or like some kind of cool truck or toy that I wanted, now we've got a problem. Well, Chase, you have an Etch-a-Sketch. Yeah, but look at what he has. This is, this is, this is human nature. This is our sinful nature. That we're fine celebrating God's grace in other people's lives as long as that grace isn't helping those people pass us or catch up to us in our dreams as we pursue them. Now, we love celebrating God's grace in other people's lives as long as they're not catching up to us or passing us. And if you don't believe me, look no further than Instagram and Facebook. The discontentment factory. The discontentment factory. Because you take your normal broken life, you get out your smartphone, and you look at everyone else's highlight reel. Man, you, you scroll through, you, you open it up in just a few seconds. Gosh, I wish I had the body they have, their, their lake or beach pictures. Man, I... 
wish I had, you know, the car and home that they got. You know, a couple, like, first-time home buyers. I mean, like, like, I don't have that. And I wish I wish I had the marriage they have. I wish my spouse wrote nice things to me on Facebook, uh, you know, for my birthday, telling me how valuable I am. And, and suddenly now, your, your life just looks pretty mediocre. You just compare. And it robs you of all your joy. Which leads us to ask this question, forces us to ask this question. How will you celebrate God's grace when he gives someone else the thing you want? How will you celebrate God's grace when he gives someone else the thing that you're hoping for, trying for? How will you celebrate God's grace when someone else gets the promotion? How will you celebrate God's grace when someone else gets pregnant? How will you celebrate God's grace when someone else goes into remission? Can you celebrate God's grace in other people's lives? Or do you only see God's grace as beautiful when it's directed to you? Is it beautiful by nature? Is God's grace worth celebrating? Or is it only beautiful when you're the direct recipient? And I think the only way to fully understand and answer this question is to embrace what Jesus says in verse 16. He gives us this little phrase that is so chock full with meaning. This is how we're going to close today. Verse 16, he just says this little phrase. So the last will be first. And the first, last. Now, you know this is important because if you look back to the last chapter, okay, chapter 19, and you look at the very last verse, the very last verse in the chapter, you see the same thing. He reverses the order, but it's the same message. But many who are first will be last, and the last, first. So, don't miss this. The parable of the laborers in the vineyard, what we've been looking at, is framed front and back by this statement. It's framed by this statement. But what does it mean? We know it's important. What does it mean? How does it relate to laboring in God's vineyard? What's what's, what's the connection there? If you want to understand what it means, you need to back up one more verse to verse 29. 29 gives us the context for understanding this phrase. It says this. Jesus says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Okay? Many who are first will be last, last will be first. So, the people who are willing to part with wealth, family, and status. They have an open hand about it. They're not living for that. The people who are willing to part with wealth, family, and status, they're last in this world. They're not climbing the ladder. They don't look impressive, but they're first in the next. And the people who hold on to, live for, and pursue wealth, family, and status, they're first in this world. They're first class. And they'll be last in the next, if they really, even really, truly love Jesus more than this world. Jesus is challenging our categories for what it looks like to win in life. He's challenging our categories for what winning looks like in this world. He's showing us what success looks like from heaven's perspective, and heads up, it's not at all what the world says it is. Not at all what the world says it is. You... You, uh, you live to come in first now, you come in last then. That's what this means. You live to come in first now, you come in last then. And this even becomes more clear if you back up and look at, look at verses 13 through 22. Jesus takes two different groups of people and compares them. Very different groups of people. One group of people's children, and then we have a rich young ruler. Children, rich young ruler. Children, uh, weak needy, and the disciples thought they were a nuisance, didn't even want to let them get to Jesus. 
candidate number one. Candidate number two is a rich young ruler, polished, successful, status, entrepreneurial, attractive. That's candidate number two. Which one is the better candidate for the kingdom of heaven? And you may think that over here, candidate two, the rich young ruler, because he's polished and entrepreneurial, no, 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 the text tells us that he doesn't follow Jesus because he can't leave his own kingdom. He loves what his hands have made. He loves his wealth and riches, and he can't come to Jesus because he's not able to leave his own kingdom and abandon that to pursue Christ. And then in verse 14, Jesus looks at the children and says, to such as these belong the kingdom of heaven. These people, the weak, the needy, the people that folks don't want around, those are the people I came for. Those are the people I came for. Because the last will be first and the first will be last. And so the parable of the workers is framed with this crucial insight. Listen, there are so many things in front of you, so many things in front of you uh, for you to love. Parents, children, career. You may even die for some of these things, but listen, friends, you cannot afford to live for them. You may die for a few of those things, children, spouse, but you cannot afford to live for them. God has saved you by His grace and promised you His kingdom. He's promised you His kingdom. And the promise that you will inherit the kingdom then is what frees you from living for your own kingdom now. The promise that you're going to inherit everything empowers you to live for just one thing. One glorious, infinitely beautiful thing. And that's Jesus. And now we have the answer to the question... How can I celebrate when God gives someone else something that I want? We're only going to be able to do that because we realize that no amount of gifts could ever compare to the fact that the gift giver himself has given himself to us. And that then frees us to celebrate um, when he gives lesser gifts to others. The fact that the gift giver himself has given himself to us. Man, that frees me to celebrate when there's lesser gifts given to other people. Like the fact that that I'm given the bank frees me to rejoice when you get your allowance. Let me me give it to you this way. Let's say that you had a friend, and they, uh, they did pretty well, okay? Better than you. And, you know, more money, more successful. And you get a call from them, they're so excited, and they say, man, guess what? I just want a million dollars. And and you're kind of like, well, good for you. I mean, I could have used that. I got student loans and kids and got some debt. But, um, yeah, I'm really happy for you. But you're not. It should have been me. I deserve that. I've worked harder than that person. I'm more gifted than that person. I'm more faithful than that person. Why did they get that? I want you to imagine this. Imagine if a day earlier you got a phone call from an offshore bank and you learned that somewhere long ago, one of your relatives, man, they made you a bank account and the interest, man, it's just built up and you have $100 trillion saved up for you. It's all yours. It is guaranteed. $100 trillion with a T dollars. And it's yours. Guaranteed. Now, when your friend calls and says, hey, I want a million dollars, can you celebrate? Yeah. Gosh, that's so great. Good for you, man. You got a million dollars? That's really special. Man, I'm so happy to to hear that. What happened? Because previously I was upset and now I'm celebrating. What happened is that I got something that was so superior in value to anything this world could offer that when God blessed someone else, it wasn't a threat to my joy. 
I got something that was so precious, so infinitely beautiful to me, so satisfying to me, that when God blessed someone else, it didn't threaten me, didn't threaten my joy. This is Christ. This is what we have in Christ, a treasure that is so valuable and beautiful that nothing compares. You got a promotion? I'm so glad you did, man. I got Jesus. I'm so glad you got a promotion. I got Jesus. You got that house? Man, that's great. Man, I have Jesus. He's the treasure. He's the treasure. So, some people ask, you know, Chase, doesn't this parable teach that it doesn't matter if you get saved when you're really little and you're in God's kingdom, you live in God's kingdom and work in God's kingdom for a long time, like your whole life, or if you get saved at the very last second, isn't part of the point of the parable that both people equally go to heaven? And the answer is absolutely it is. Absolutely. Thief on the cross, right before he expires, Jesus looks at him and says, you'll be with me in paradise. That is not meant as a model for how you should live, though. It's meant as a model for the sufficiency of God's grace to save anyone, however he wants, whenever he wants. And I've heard people say, well, Chase, if I can just get saved at the last second, I mean, truly repent and believe and get saved. And I think you can. Let's be very clear about that this morning. If you truly, and that's the operative word there, truly repent and believe, you'd be saved any time, any time on this earth. And people will say, well, if that's true, why don't, why don't I do this? I see a strategy here. Why don't I just live however I want to? Okay, my whole life, and I can avoid all the thou shalts and thou shalt nots. Okay, I, can do, I don't have to like forego any fun things, and I can do all the awesome things. And then right before I die, listen, right before as I'm about to, uh, okay, I just say, forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. And he, he forgives me, and then I go to heaven just like everyone else, just like all your church friends, just like everyone else. Why can't I do that? Won't that work? What, what is wrong with that plan? Because I get the same reward. doesn't matter if you come into the kingdom at the last hour or at the beginning. What's wrong with that plan? And what we fail to realize when we're asking that question is that we're seeking the wrong reward. The, the reward of heaven is it's not a place. It's a person. And you forfeited your whole life doing life with the person. The reward, listen to me, part of the reward is getting to labor in the vineyard with the master. Part of the reward is being united to the Master through faith and experiencing all the benefits of His love and protection and provision as you walk through life. All His power, all of His grace available to you in Christ. And the people who came late, they skipped out on that. They're just getting to know the Master. Just getting to know the Master. There's benefit. Of course there's benefit. You want to know Jesus? You want to know Him now. You don't have to wait for eternity to know Jesus. You can know Him now, and He's the reward. Listen, He's the reward now, and He'll be the reward then. It's like we're going to get to heaven, shake His hand, thank Him for saving us, and be like, I'm going to check the place out. No, no, no. He's the reward. He's the prize. And when we get saved, it's like a dad bringing his kid to work, not because he needs him, because he wants, he wants him. He wants to work alongside his son. Sets him up little projects for him to do in the office. Why? Because the joy of a father working with a son. We want to work together. That's what salvation is. God doesn't need our efforts. God doesn't need our disciple making. Don't you think he could come up with a better way to save, a more efficient, faster way to save the world than relying on you and me? He wants us to be a part of his plan. He has folded us in so that we could participate in redemption to work in his vineyard, not for salvation, but simply because we have salvation. We want to extend that to every marketplace in the world. This is the hope we have in the gospel. And so I would just ask you to consider like, your own heart. When you think about the grace of God in your life, do you find that you, you picture God as kind of being stingy? Kind of being really not that generous? Do you see yourself as the 12-hour workers who are getting the short stick in life? Or do you see yourself as someone who has got immeasurably more than you deserve? Maybe you're a non-believer today. 
When you, when you think of Christianity or even the gospel, do you think of it as this thing where you try really hard and then because you tried hard to be a good person, God saves you? Or do you realize what this text teaches? That God's gift of eternal life has nothing to do with how hard you work because no amount of work could ever earn eternal life. No amount of work could ever earn this reward. It didn't matter if you worked for 12 hours or 12 million years. You still wouldn't earn enough for this to be a proper compensation. You'd fall so short. And everyone has. Except for one. And his name's Jesus. That's why we have hope. That's why I have hope this morning, because 2,000 years ago, in Palestine, there was a Jew who came, and he lived the life that you were supposed to live, and that I was supposed to live. And we all failed, but he didn't. He didn't fail. And he stands ready to give you credit with that record when you repent and believe. This is how we're saved. We're not saved because we try harder, we make commitments to be better people. We're saved when we realize that no amount of effort can bring us back to God and we trust in Christ to do just that. Oh God, help us be faithful and grateful as we consider your truly unearned grace to the least of these. And your incredible kindness in bringing us into your vineyard and allowing us to labor alongside of you in the work of the kingdom. God, thank you for this opportunity to think about your grace as it's revealed to us in the, this parable. God, we confess corporately that we're so tempted to believe that we deserve more than what we have. We are so tempted to look around on Facebook and Instagram and in our neighborhoods and see people with better cars and better houses and more health and better marriages and spouses that seem like they be, may, might be more interesting to be with, God. And we compare, and as we do, our, the grace in, uh, of, of your, your grace in our lives begins to shrink. We begin to think that you're stingy, that we've got the short straw, that you love others so much more. And God, I just ask that you would produce repentance in our heart for that. Areas of our hearts where you find ingratitude, God, would you produce repentance? God, we say corporately this morning that you've given us far more than we deserve in Christ and that every moment that we're not under your wrath is immeasurably more than other, anything we could ever ask or imagine. God, I pray that as we realize the treasure we have in Christ, we, you, you would free us to celebrate your grace in the lives of other people rather than feeling like it's a threat to our joy. God, we pray that because we're so satisfied in Christ that we would truly rejoice when someone else gets the thing we're praying for. Because our joy is not ultimately in our circumstances and your love for us is not ultimately measured in the, in the last gift you gave us. It's measured in the one gift you gave us 2,000 years ago, Jesus. And continue to give us today through the Holy Spirit. So Father, would you exalt the glory of your Son, Jesus, in our lives as we labor in his vineyard to make disciples and live a life that places Christ on display as supremely valuable. We ask all this in